So as many of you will know, I'm attempting to host an audiobook club throughout this year as part of my ongoing Audible sponsorship. Now these are held at the end of the month and so far I've been streaming them on Twitch. The next flight of the Eisenstein is this coming weekend, Sunday the 28th, and details will be posted below this video and in my community tab. Of course, many people wanted me to upload this discussion raw here on YouTube, but because it was a very long discussion that I am also hosting only by some of my own notes that I've made, and it's not a scripted thing, it's very easy for this to become rambling, basically. So this video is an edited down version where I've trimmed away as much of the fat as possible. But even with my editing, I wanted to say that because this is an unscripted discussion, there's more vocal pauses and in general less structure than some of my ordinary videos. This might seem very obvious, but believe me, it's something I wanted to note clearly. So this is very much a casual discussion. It's not a scripted law video. And with that in mind, this is also a much simpler video with a placeholder throughout and a few sections of images here and there. Honestly, I'm not sure if people will enjoy this format or not, but as I always say, if it does as well as my other videos, I'll continue to edit these down throughout the year for uploading here, but if the format is just too rambling for people, and this is reflected by the views and so on, then I'll probably avoid it going forward. But I do hope you guys enjoy, as Valdor is a very interesting narrative. I recommend also getting it on audiobook via Audible, as it's a really well-produced piece, and it's only six hours. And very obviously, I'll take the opportunity to say, if you want to sign up for Audible, you'll see the link on the screen right here, audible.com forward slash Lutin. Please use that, and it's linked down below as well. If you want to sign up, helps me, helps the channel, and so on. I also know many of you guys just enjoy me doing these long discuss videos to listen to for painting or for sleep or whatever, so I think this will be a good one for you to kind of tune in with and just have on in the background. So once again, I hope you enjoy as we discuss Valdor, Birth of the Imperium, and also I will note, obviously, this is a discussion about the story, and there's some other things in there as well, so spoilers in general, 40k spoilers in general throughout this. As always, if you do enjoy and you want to see me do this throughout the rest of this year, please drop a like, share your thoughts about this story in the comments below. Okay, here we go. Section one. So I just want to read. Uh, I just want to read the first little bit here for you guys. Okay. So we'll just remind ourselves where we are. It was a time of turmoil. For thousands of years, Terra was divided. Its petty warlords vying for supremacy. An age of strife reigned, and it was bloody. And then came the Emperor. Through his will and the armies of savage thunder warriors, did he bring order to a chaotic world. His desire nothing less than the preeminence of mankind. Foremost among his soldiers were the custodian guard, a peerless warrior brotherhood, his generals and war leaders. The greatest of these was Constantine Valdor, the dauntless captain. Unity was inevitable. The tyrants crushed or brought to heel, alloyed under one banner. And so the nascent Imperium was born, a new era had begun. As the old night faded and the warp storms that had estranged terror from the distant tribes of humanity abated, the Emperor's gaze turned to the mastery of the stars themselves, new armies were raised stronger than the old. The indomitable Space Marine Legions, unity had come, and so the Great Crusade then beckoned. So the opening setting, um, I really enjoy the first section here, I love this first section uh, where you have the Emperor presumably talking to a Valdor when he's being birthed. It's like really amazing, the sort of sound design, and I really enjoy the atmosphere there. Um, you get a strong impression about the Emperor's kind of character, but also you're kind of guessing about how sort of manipulative he is. And then after that, you start with this figure of Sevu, uh, who's inspecting Mount Ararat uh, under seemingly this command of uh, Kandawai, uh, who has her suspicions about what's going on. There was a massacre and a cover up. So we learn that these High Lords as well, the High Lords, uh, we learn that these are a very recent invention with what's happening in the unification. Uh, the Emperor and Malkador had created a class of bureaucrats called the Magisters uh, Temporal, and these became the Lords Civilian. The four greatest Lords Civilian were the four High Lords, and those were the Master of the Administratum, the Grand Provost Marshal, Chancellor of the Estate, Imperium, and Lord Commander Militant of the Imperial Armies. Uh, so we move on then, uh, you come to chapter two, you get a strong sense, this is really, we're talking about the opening of the book. You get a strong sense as well, of course, in the unification about how the Earth has been 
you know, devastated. The environment has completely collapsed. The ecosystem is destroyed and been obliterated. You hear as well about the location where the emperor is building this vast fortress city and how a lot of people are referencing the fact that it's totally impractical. Uh, they're using nuclear power. You have uh, Simonis and Valdor talking a little bit about the absurdity of building the city here. But Valdor is talking as well about how it's going to be this big symbol. Valdor. OK, so here's another one. Here's a, here's a question. Uh, Valdor enters uh, 35 minutes in to the story and uh, you know some people have said that they think this is way too long there's a good quote from this time as well uh, Valdor and Simonis where they're talking about and he says uh, Valdor says we're extensions of a single will we're the periphery not its heart so he's talking about of course Emperor didn't bother me I like how Valdor's intro was built up needed to thrash out the character and develop the story Mm, yeah, possibly. Well, we'll come to that later. Somebody saying, uh, I think the book had little to do with Valdor as a character besides saying what he's not. For a pretty short book, didn't feel like there was enough Valdor. Yeah, I mean, uh, there, well, we will get into this a little later on, but it's actually the fact that there isn't a lot of Valdor. It's kind of like when they say you should listen to the to the notes they're not playing in terms of music, you know. Valdor's not there because he doesn't really need to be. It's like there's there's a whole issue, but we will we'll get to that later. So in this first section of the book, we're seeing as well how the early Imperium already there is a lot of bureaucracy, and this is starting to slow things down to become really problematic. And this is really at day one as well. Uh, you know, it's it's really interesting to see that where you have with the Imperium, and they're they're really only just starting out. They've just got the High Lords happening, and already they've got like tons of bureaucracy in the way of everything. Uh, so it makes you start to think, uh, and yeah, Valdor notes, he says, an, ar an army conquers, but an administration rules. So then you have the Imperium's bureaucracy, and it makes you wonder, is this really by design? You know, if it's happening so early, they've gone from this period of absolute world-wrapped anarchy and destruction and warring barbarians and warlords all slaughtering each other all over the place. And then you go from that straight away, and actually one of the other characters talks about this later, um, but they go from that straight into the Imperium's bureaucracy. It's just like they just go straight into having this this bureaucratic nightmare. It makes you wonder, you know, like, is this by design? You know, do they deliberately start to slow things down to make it really difficult for people to get things? Because it, you know, nothing seems to really happen without the Emperor deliberately designing it to be that way. There, there's several characters that talk about how things are changing too fast. And there's this idea that, you know, as well, creating barriers, you, when you have a lot of bureaucracy, it creates a lot of barriers. And a lot of people just kind of, they can't be bothered to get through it. You know, they just get disillusioned because you feel like you're never getting anywhere. And that's actually kind of what happens with Valdor and Kandawire, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll come to them as well. Then also, in the beginning, we have Kandawire, uh, one of the main characters. Uh, we get our first impression of Kandawire. And, you know, straight away, Kandawa, she's a kind of, I would say, a fairly unlikable character, I think. There, there are some laudable things, but uh, she comes across as pretty arrogant. She's lamenting about the state of the world, and she dreams about it being restored. Uh, she's really frustrated about the state of things, and she's always talking about her desire uh, to sort of rectify this. Uh, she's thinking about her childhood and the father's tales that he told to her about how the earth used to be she's not known it any different she's only known it to be this this barren wasteland but her father had sort of reminisced about like how the earth used to be or you know within the context of the time frame we're talking about anyway by the time we reach uh, the fourth chapter as well Kandawire is already uh, looking to Valdor and sort of looking to interview him and putting him into an inquiry and and I'm just skimming over things here because we're just kind of opening stuff up I'm not going to go into detail these first sections were just kind of where we get to with the first sort of five chapters also a lot of the chapters in this are quite short and they are just kind of like these people go here and they talk about this you know it's like this is a very character driven thing so a lot of the detail kind of comes later on anyway and then you have this character of Ofar uh, this is basically Kandawai's sort of main assistant but we get some interesting insights here into both the people but also the the general state of things we learn about how people are already getting into this idea of the bureaucracy and all this kind of stuff and you're quickly forgetting about the the anarchy that's been happening uh, the strictness of things is being forgotten and this character of Ofar he's talking about how he's able to really surprisingly get access to anywhere he wants to just by his appearance and you know the, the things that he's wearing and so again there's this kind of a, a impression of bureaucracy kind of taking over and people 
not really taking things quite as seriously as they were initially when the emperor was sort of in charge. So this idea about the bureaucracy coming in, but already like some kind of like decay, the sort of decay of authority already sort of beginning to happen straight away. Ophar's Kandawai's assistant, and we find out that he's this administratum uh, prefect, basically, is something like a high level of an administrator or magistrate. So far, when he's walking through the city, you have these really good descriptions about ordinary life. So you hear like music, the synth sounds, he's talking about people listening to vox players, uh, military choirs, people being all rammed together into these small spaces, families in these tiny rooms and arguments, and basically kind of a refugee camp in many ways. Um, but I, I did have the thought, like, what do you guys think about that? Do you, how did you imagine that section? where he's coming into the city and because we we never hear too much about civilians and so that was quite good i thought because it does talk a little to the sort of background and the things that are happening here so yeah i, I was like do you imagine it to be more like in terminator where in terminator he goes car reese he goes back down into the sort of bunker of the uh, the rebels and you see all the people trying to live their lives or not live their lives they're just sitting in you know scrubby holes in the ground basically but the people are very sad you know and uh or is it more something like just kind of 19th century living where it's kind of very compacted you know uh, but i enjoyed that section where they're sort of it's very small but they're just talking about this question could the emperor have intended for the administration to be slow so that uh he was needed to keep it all together so that everything would collapse if he were not there um i don't think so i mean the the emperor is very arrogant um i don't think he des needs to design it that way i mean he's literally just crushed terror already uh without needing that so i don't think he needs to do that i think it's more to set things up later down the line and to sort of you know set in motion the bureaucracy because also there's always this idea that the emperor is planning way 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 in advance um, and so this idea about this sort of bureaucracy creeping in makes me think that's by design to you know set up for the fact that later that bureaucracy is going to be very necessary when you have like millions of planets all trying to you know contribute and, and make requests and all this kind of stuff it's like the bureaucracy becomes necessary then to like slow everything down because they haven't built the, the city hasn't been built in terms of really focusing for civilian needs at this point in time you know it's a very they're focusing on kind of getting the military aspect up and running and then later on they actually talk about this they talk about the kind of scale and how empty it is and uh, you know they're, they're they're building the palace and the um <clears throat> the imperial city for like a different age they're not really building it for the people that are there right now um which i think is interesting as well so then we have kandawire interviewing valdor this is uh, sort of chapter four and five this is where you start to get the feel for kandawire uh, about how she's longing for something she seems so like idealistic and and she's really kandawire she sort of is sort of imagining like a, a democratic imperium really like that's kind of seems to be the feeling that she has but also she does kind of know that it isn't you know it's almost like she's wishing that it were just a bit more free basically i think she's i think she and a lot of the people on terror at this time are used to having lived under warlords and these people that are like keeping them down and what she really wants is she wants to have a more well-educated society she she wants to have like this kind of more open free society the way the high lords are put in place and the way this structure is put in place i think she gets the feeling of like oh yeah things are happening this is it's going in the right direction and then you have this incident with the thunder warriors and valdor and she realizes oh no it's actually not the way it is and i think though she kind of realizes this as well it talks actually about her sort of kind of realizing once she starts talking to valdor but it's kind of too late she's already sort of started down that road so she decides i've just got to see it through yeah she wants to be a more civilian government um but that is also kind of what the emperor had sort of alluded a little that they were you know he's always said about how humanity should kind of govern itself and that the space marines and all this other stuff is just there to protect but the humans are supposed to be running the show and it's like yeah that kind of doesn't really work out at any time she want, and, and when it did it actually didn't go very well she wants a more utopian perfect place with rules and morals but the reality is it just gets grittier and darker yeah i think so definitely so she she, she starts to interview valdor and uh, she realizes like this is really not going very well she really wants to protest about how things should be done and she keeps trying to hammer that on to valdor but in the end he basically just ignores her 
and he gives her like lip service. It's kind of hilarious, actually. Um, we also learn from Valdor about how the Thunder Warriors and their violent aggression is becoming a weakness. We learn about them having these Primarchs, which, again, could be confusing. But the Primarchs, they're clearly not the same as Space Marine Primarchs because they're Thunder Warrior Primarchs. They're basically just Thunder Warriors that have been given a rank. They're, they're not, like, specially adapted or superhuman in any, like, massive way. Kanawa is basically convinced that Valdor should be kind of more owning about the massacre you know they should be more upfront about it and she seems to view the custodies as really just kind of powerful ordinary humans she doesn't really seem to get the difference between them like she doesn't seem to get that at all she doesn't seem to realize that they're really completely different in their outlook and their feelings and that he is near enough incapable of having these more human emotions and that's kind of the crux that's really driving her entire investigation is that she is kind of assuming that, hey, oh, yeah, these guys are, are like ordinary people when they're very clearly not. So around this time as well, we have Ofar, who's Kandawai's assistant, is, is bringing her stuff and information. And also you're starting to hear him talk about uh, this military buildup. It's not been made clear to ordinary humans the breadth of both the Emperor's vision and the differences between some of his you know, servants and stuff. And uh, I'm curious what people think are the reasons for that. Why the Emperor hasn't said, you know, why the Emperor hasn't said to the people on Terra, hey, we're going to fix the planet and then we're going to go off and we're going to do all this stuff and we're going to create this huge thing. I, I find it quite interesting that it's, it's pretty obvious that he hasn't even made that clear to the High Lords. You would think it would be kind of necessary to sort of tell them like, oh, you guys can focus on looking after Terra but we're also doing all this other stuff. I'm, I'm kind of interested that they didn't need to tell them that. The Emperor seems very cynical. Uh, yeah, I mean, it could well be that the Emperor sort of... I mean, yeah, because there's a lot of things that the Emperor doesn't want to tell people. Uh, he doesn't want to tell them about, obviously, with Chaos, the most obvious one. There's a lot of stuff that doesn't get revealed to people. I suppose, yes, yes, maybe mentioning it would create debate, which he doesn't want. Yeah, he just is like the less people know the better, this is happening, and they don't actually need to know. Um, so that definitely could be the way to go. So there's also this thing of uh, there being too much happening too soon, as I've said a little. Kandawaya, she talks about how things are happening too fast, she actually says that. Um, and that is also noted by, like, uh, Amar Astarte later. Uh, this is always this ongoing theme, <clears throat> and this, this crops up in other places too. There's always this ongoing theme about the Emperor pushing things way too fast, um, you actually hear this also in the book Saturnine. Uh, it's actually implied that this is a kind of a character flaw of the Emperor. So it's very interesting and noteworthy that an ordinary human like uh, Kandawa, she is noting this as well as people that already know him better. So in Saturnine, we hear Erda as well. This is a little off topic, I, I admit. Uh, Erda in, in Saturnine, and she's, um, <clears throat> she's talking about the Emperor. She says, he believed he knew everything he needed to know. He constantly pushed ahead. And that's the irony. She says, we are mortals. He couldn't wear to bear to waste time. Natural evolution takes millions of years. He refused to wait that long. He'd worked for 20, 30,000 years, and he felt that uh, this was more than time enough. So the natural stewardship of the perpetuals born through the evolutionary cycle was not rapid enough for the, him, the emperor. The thing is as well, we don't, we still, I think, don't know all the emperor knows. So there may have been a reason why he decided he needed to push everything forward so quickly. Uh, it may be that there was a bit of a ticking clock that we're not aware of. Um, I still think that might be it. However, another part of a lot of the story kind of just points towards, like I say story, I mean the entire story of 40k. A lot of it points towards the Emperor just being kind of impatient and like he's just had enough of all this pissing around and he wants to crack on. Throughout, uh, there's a lot of references about the palace. Uh, we see this, like I said, on a low level by Ofar. He's walking through the halls, seeing the ordinary people. We hear Valdor talking about like the gothic beauty of it all. Uh, we hear about it being powered by nuclear energy. They also talk a bit about the, the ground below and these massive uh, water fil filtration systems. And then a lot of absurdity about like why they've decided to build it here, like kind of on top of the world. Interesting, they always talk about it as being Himalaya. Obviously not a place for us right now, but obviously you can kind of imagine where that is. Uh, they talk about how a lot of the palace itself is built to this, like we said, immense scale, which seems 
almost insane at this point. These huge, empty, empty halls, vast, empty halls. And obviously the idea is that this is perhaps going to be filled by something later. So it's probably quite obvious that the reason they're leaving these gigantic, high, open spaces is both uh, for armies, but also for titans later on down the line. The last thing I want to mention for the sort of opening section uh, is uh, Morland Sen. So... Morland Sen is this small piece in the first few chapters, it's chapter 5 specifically. It's brought up later when Valdor notes that he has felt this presence that they felt at Morland Sen. He feels this later when they're recovering the Astartes project material from the lab uh, down below in the gene labs. But Valdor, when he's uh, speaking to Kandawai, he says about Morland Sen, he says, we were not simply fighting for territory, we were fighting to remove the taint of sorcery from terror. He says, I see your smile. Again, this is now not widely understood, a consequence of our success, I suppose. He says, you say sorcery now and you'll provoke a laugh of disbelief. But during the anarchy, all manner of beliefs were held, which led many into moral corruption. The human soul, if left untended, tends to moral corruption and that opens doors. This world had been left untended for a very long time and many doors had been left open. He says, so alongside the physical challenges, there's also the presence of other obstacles. Ghosts dogged us. And Kandawai, she says, uh, you mean that figuratively, I presume? And he says, no, I use what seems to be the proper term. So this is pretty interesting because it's basically noting that there is this potential already on terror for likely uh, warp influences and incursions. And the emperor is already aware of it. And so he knows right from the beginning but still keeps everybody ignorant of this, and seemingly even the Custodes, because Valdor, he's talking quite vaguely about it here, but we can't know specifically how much they know. You would imagine that potentially they would know. Okay, so section two characters. Uh, this is where we get into a little bit more detail. Constantine Valdor. Uh, Valdor is, of course, Captain General of the Custodian Guard. He's basically the commander. And whilst we've got the High Lords, Valdor is basically in charge. Also, of course, Malkador, whilst the Emperor is doing whatever he's doing. And Valdor, we see straight away, he's very cool headed to almost a point of emotionless apathy. Then we have Uoma uh, Kandawai. Kandawai is pretty interesting. She's this early High Lord of Terror and the Grand Provost Marshal of the Adeptus Arbites. Uh, she's born in the Banda Confederacy of Southeastern Africa, and she's born into this uh, slightly wealthy family. Uh, she's got, like, quite, I say, quite progressive views about the direction of the Imperium, but she's also totally unaware that this means really anything more than the running of Terra itself. So she has this very kind of, like I say, sort of idealistic view, but she doesn't really get that they're basically just in charge of running Terra, and there's a lot of other stuff happening that's really much of a bigger deal. Question, are these the same custodies as in the later millennia? The custodies are sort of like, they're, they're sort of artificially immortal. Uh, they're not really, they're not really, um, they're not like um, perpetuals. But yeah, they live for a super long time. Question, I think Malkador sounds a little sinister when he has his little cameo at the end. Malkador, when doesn't he sound sinister? Like the most sinister, he's like... <laughs> There's literally, I mean, there's, I've got some quotes lined up later that are literally talking about Malkador and it's like how he's like the Emperor's shadow. And uh, there's something about how, oh, there's a great quote. There's a great quote I've got later on where it's talking about how the Emperor deals with it, but, and then Malkador tears it down with a thousand lies, you know. Uh, Mal yeah, he's the he's the dad of the Inquisition and he's also involved with the Assassin, uh, Assassin Rorum, uh, the You know, so he, Malkador is, is sketchy as hell. Yeah, and he always appears that way. He's always like this dark figure with like a, you know, a hood and a cape, and he's just in the shadows. You know, he's like, you know, listening to everything, watching everything. He's he's Malkador is such a great character. I actually am always slightly frustrated that uh, Malkador dies. Spoilers: Malkador dies um, at the uh, obviously at the the end of the heresy, and uh, this is a shame because he's such an amazing character. You know, it would have been cool, like, if, if he hadn't died and he had sort of continued on, at least for, like, a few thousand years or something to kind of uh, lead things in a in a certain direction. And then, you know, you could still have stuff like uh, the Sisters of Battle coming in later and, and all that kind of crap happening with that period in time. 
Yeah, that's right. Uh, it does talk about the creation of the Custodes in the book. The Custodes are these custom creations, whereas the Astartes are the mass-produced. Um, and and the, the Custodes are like... I mean, there's uh, there's actually a bit that I, I'll talk about later. But yeah, the Custodes, the Custodes are interesting because... I mean, for for one thing, the emperor highlights he doesn't really the emperor the emperor doesn't really need all these people like uh, Amar Astarte, like he doesn't need all these people. They're useful to him, uh, and and uh, Erdo and stuff. He doesn't need these these gene rights. He only needs them because he's got way too much to do. Like he can't, you know. There's so much happening. He's trying to deal with Terra. He's trying to deal with Luna. He's trying to deal with Mars. He's trying to, you know. There's so much happening. And, and he's trying to deal with all this crap. And he hasn't got time to be doing all the stuff in the lab whilst he's out doing all these other things. Also, just the scale of what he's trying to do. He needs these people to help. Um, so that's why you have these other characters come in. But with Custodes, you see uh, that, you know, the, the, the Emperor is able to just make these himself, like, initially. He doesn't need the help of all these other people. And also, the, there's a big difference with making Custodes to making Astartes, which is that the Custodes are made basically from very early infancy uh, like i don't it never specifies exactly it's very suggestive that it's very early like <clears throat> maybe the first year almost like uh, because they have to go in and really adapt their genetics at a very sort of base level so that they sort of develop more naturally the space moons are kind of way more forcible it's kind of more violent whereas the the custodies are more kind of like a natural genetic improvement enhancement essentially Seeing that it was mostly Astarte's work, it does not seem so unlikely that Cole could improve Marines later. She even said they were not perfect. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a whole thing with Astarte. When they say it's mostly her work, I mean, yeah, but, like, the Emperor has a very large amount of involvement there as well. Um, you know, she obviously is, like, a very big, important factor, but she wouldn't have been able to do any of it without the Emperor <clears throat> when he brought her on board. So, because basically she was she was sort of doing her weird experimentation with techno barbarians, and she was obviously very good at what she did. And the emperor saw like a lot of potential in her, but the you know the, there is a lot of emphasis that the base element is the emperor, and Astarte kind of just worked off of that. Also, there was things that she couldn't resolve, and she needed like the character I forget his name, but the the character who it was in like um, the great work with Belisarius Call, <clears throat> the character before Belisarius Call. He's this other genius guy, and he's also around that time, and he fixed some things that Astarte couldn't, and so on. And we have the subsidiary characters. So we have uh, Sivu, uh, who seems to be this Arbates operative. Uh, he's basically just looking at the uh, Thunder Warriors on Ararat. We've got Ofar, like we talked about, is this Administratum Prefect. Um, the Ofar is kind of interesting, how he has a fake augment augmented eyepiece. So it's almost like, I like this idea of Ofar having this fake augmented eyepiece just for show, just to kind of be like, yeah, yeah, I'm, I, you know, to give him maybe some status or something. Ofar talks about having these stolen identities, lock words, giving him access surprisingly to things he doesn't expect. And that even if people just see his uniform and so on, they think, wow, okay, this guy's, this guy's serious. So they let him through security areas he probably shouldn't be, which is kind of interesting. Um... Oh, and he also has the classic, uh, the eagle with the lightning, uh, golden for his, uh, you know, sort of show, shows this off to people. And, and, and like I was saying with the bureaucracy and things already starting to decay a little quite early on, Ofar talks about how already people are forgetting about the anarchy that they've just come out of, uh, that they're reverting to the more servile type of nature in the humans because they're like, oh, everything's calm now. So we're just going to do what we're told and there isn't less upright because they know they can't. They know they can't really rise up. This is something which I can kind of plays into what people always ask me about the Imperium. When people say, oh, you know, if the Imperium is so terrible, um, if, it, if it's such a nightmare, why don't people rebel? People always rebel in human, human history, so surely they would rebel in the Imperium. People often forget that it's like, yeah, rebelling in the Imperium is very different than rebelling now on our planet because rebelling in the imperium is like you're just going to get slaughtered <laughs> and they kind of realize that with the unification wars which is why people are going to this kind of very servile attitude because they're like well what's the point you know the thunder warriors will just annihilate us so they don't even bother they just they just do what they're told which i think is interesting and so ofar talks about that he talks about commands rarely being need to be enforced he says they were taken on enthusiastically drunk drunk in by a populace who still remembered the alternatives yeah so people are actually people are actually loving being told what to do for a change because it's been such chaos that where it's just kind of like every person for themselves and and so now there's some order and people are loving it they're loving being told what to do because they haven't had it for like you know hundreds of years or more 
Okay. Well, I can mention it now, but I wanted to mention it later. But this is in the this is in the audiobook. Okay. The so Dartsum says, um, <clears throat> "Why do you think the Astarte is got named after Mr. Astarte? Seems a strange honor to give somebody who tried to sabotage." They they actually talk about this in the the book, where basically it's it's told uh, that. The fact the Astartes, uh, I'll talk about it more later, but basically the fact the Astartes are called Astarte after Amar Astarte is basically the Emperor having a really kind of sick joke because he's basically like, oh, yeah, Astarte, she, she, she worked really hard and she did all this really amazing work creating the Space Marines and so on. And, uh, and then not only that, but she turned traitor against me. But he's like, yeah, I'm still going to call them Astarte because it's like a wink and a nod, like, haha, <laughs> it's like screwed up. And it's basically like, uh, I think Malkador, he's talking about it and he says, oh, yeah, the emperor, he likes this kind of. And, and this is another thing from Saturnine, like um, Erda, she talks about how the emperor has like a lot of humor, actually. She talks about him being kind of like she says he's funny. Uh, and, and you don't really ever get that impression, but the uh, Erda, she, and so, yeah, there is a lot of it, it's like a, a dark it's kind of sick joke and it, it, it is kind of funny as the emperor is just kind of like yeah fuck you mr astarte <laughs> he's like because astarte not only did she not only did she try to destroy the space marines but she also thought they were like horribly flawed and it would all go wrong and so the emperor is just like yeah screw it they're still going to be astarte like it's <laughs> It is kind of funny, and they, I, I like it. I'll talk about it more later because it, it leads into something else that I think about with 40k. But uh. other characters we have, we have a killer. A killer is this techno barbarian kind of guy. He's a mercenary warrior. We see him. Uh, uh, a killer. The the earlier part with a killer is more interesting, because a killer he's talking in the early story about again the sort of unification period, and he's talking about the the techno barbarian mercenary uh, warrior as, and he's talking about the development of things from like a normal human on the ground perspective. So he's talking about the ports and the factories being built, and that this progress is basically inescapable. He's talking about all these flags suddenly appearing all over the place with lightning eagles and so on and so on. And Achilla, he's he's actually kind of confused. Achilla's used to living in this environment of like sort of brutality and constant fighting and slaughter and mercenary work, and that's like all he knows. So Achilla is actually really surprised uh, when things start to change. And Achilla, he really hates this. He's like, oh, this sucks. Like, we can't just go around, like, randomly killing people anymore. He, he hates it. Like, he, he you know, he, he talks about how, oh, it's so great. You could just go and, like, sort of, you know, go to a town and slaughter everyone and take whatever you want. You know, and, and, and now he's like, god damn it. We have to we have to do what we're told. And he's like, oh, everybody just seems to be doing it. So I guess I'll do it too. And he's kind of, like, bitter about it. Um, and he talks about how... You know, he's, he talks about what he considered were these, these good times that were really fun. Because um, a good bit of battle, basically. But he talks about how he he, he overhears people saying about how things are so much better now than the, the bad times. And he's like, what? Like, he ne it never occurs to him that actually, like, going around just killing everybody is, like, not good. Like, he, he doesn't get it. Um, so, yeah. I was wondering on the spelling on it. Yes, that is true, the spelling. Spelling of what, specifically? Oh, a killer. It's a... A killer is uh, A-C-H-I-L-L-A. -L so eventually a killer uh, joins in with all these troops and so on. Yeah, Candawire is uh, K-A-N-D-A and then just Wire as well. Uh, eventually a killer joins Candawire uh, as they sort of, well he doesn't really join her. He's in the sort of band of people that are um, assaulting this, the, the palace. Um, and uh, he gets horribly slaughtered because he's just a scrub. Uh, but he does get a little bit of a one-up. The only reason he joins up with this sort of band of people that are that are going to do this fighting and whatever, he just is like, oh, maybe I'll have an opportunity to do a bit of fighting. Like, he doesn't give a shit what's going on. Like, he just he just thinks, oh, yeah, this would be a good opportunity for me to kill some stuff. Like, so he, he's just kind of going along with it for fun. Um, so, so anyway, that's good. Ushatan. Uh, Ushatan is another character, the Primarch of the 4th Legion Thunder Warriors. Uh, and again, like we said, Ushtan, he's not really a Primarch in the sense we would understand the modern time. Uh, he's not physically different from the other Thunder Warriors, just promoted for basically battlefield performance. Amar Astarte, uh, we have Amar Astarte, we see her later on, uh, although it's fairly secondary narrative within the main story. It just basically serves to explain the fact that she becomes really disillusioned with the Emperor's project. Uh, she tries to destroy it, and like we were saying. He's not useless. We, well, nobody said he was useless. You know, uh, we needed a snapshot of who's so stupid to rebel 
We'll say he's given a perspective. No, no, no. He, there's, there's, he's not useless. That's why I'm naming him as a character. If I, if he wasn't had any worth, I wouldn't name him as a character. Uh, he's obviously a killer's a really interesting kind of character. Like I like I said, he has some interesting perspective. You know, so you actually see it from the other side. Like he's seeing from from how we see things with a killer, we see somebody who is actually really enjoying the state of of terror at the time. You know, this kind of Mad Max sort of apocalypse. The reason the killer is an interesting character, <clears throat> on, on one level, he's very two-dimensional. He's just like this kind of old techno cyborg who just likes kicking the shit up. But that's actually kind of interesting because usually we see things from the perspective of people sorting out the Imperium. But then suddenly you have a killer coming in and he's just like, damn it, I was really enjoying going to towns and just murdering people. And <laughs> he's kind of pissed off, you know? It's like things are more difficult now, more complicated now. He's like, oh, you know, you have to do what you're told, and there's laws and all these stupid laws, you know. See if any bit, right? We'll just we'll just play we'll play a game real quick. And then when you guess what my favorite part of this audiobook is, it's so hard to remember that. I'll give you guys like ten seconds, it will rest my voice as well. Yeah, you, you nobody's gonna get it. <laughs> nobody's gonna get it. Cause you guys are thinking Al Luton. He's so like, you know. He's going to really enjoy the serious narrative, character character play, and all this kind of stuff. <laughs> okay, I'll tell you. My favorite part, okay, is the next, the next, it's not really a character, it's characters. Um, my, my favorite part of the book is the exemplars. <laughs> the exemplars. The exemplars are hilarious. So the exemplars, <clears throat> the exemplars are meant to be this really hyper- dedicated like i love the setup the exemplars are meant to be this like super dedicated force that are specifically grown to be the defenders uh for amar astarte okay they're basically like her custodies right she 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 gene grows these guys uh, or, or you know adapts or whatever but basically th th she's been she's been laying the groundwork She's been sort of setting this up that these exemplars are like her specialist army. So she, she sort of activates the exemplars, you know, and, and they're all sort of getting ready and they're going down into the labs to defend and da da da. So it sets up, it sets up like how the exemplars are like this elite Imperial Guard force and they're gonna, they're gonna hold the line and they get shredded. Like, <laughs> it takes like two custodies and like they're trying to shoot them and it's just like, psh, psh, like nothing's even happening like they're just using the flashlight guns and like they're just it's making like little black lines on the armor but like nothing and like i think there's i can't i didn't get the quote actually i should have looked for the quote but there's a quote where like it's talking about one of them one of the exemplars this named exemplar and he sees like one of them just literally thrown across the room like and smashed like broken <laughs> and they just there's like two custodies and they just they just go through them and it's just like they just they just get absolutely slaughtered like ruined and i just love it it's hilarious they're so funny um but so yeah that's my favorite thing and the other thing that's funny it's twice funny because yes yes Demo, demos has just has said it it's twice as funny because not only do they, it's comical that they're set up as like this elite force and they just get absolutely wrecked and they're like they're almost they're trying to fight but like it's just nothing and they just get absolutely slaughtered cut to pieces and uh and then it's twice as funny because it takes all of them being killed but apparently that is just enough to have actually delayed the custodies like like by like 20 seconds <laughs> So it's like it's like they all get horrifically slaughtered, but it's like, yep, you, the death of all of you was worth it because we got twenty seconds, which stopped <laughs> Sirenus uh, interfering with the Starte. So it, it's just hilarious. So that's my that's my favorite thing in the book. Just so comical, absolutely hilarious. It actually kind of like hits the nail on the head with the Imperial Guard of like their purpose because they're basically yeah they're just like fodder. <laughs> it's just. Oh, it's so good. Uh, yeah. So anyway, I just it's really, really funny. Question. Did Amar Astarte move against the Emperor? See, you guys are getting the hang of this. This is good you're getting the hang of this now because I'm going to be doing these every month. Pretty much every month. I might have some stuff come up later in the year. But Question. Did Amar Astarte uh, move against the Emperor because she doesn't like the Emperor's vision of the Imperium? 
or because the whole imp uh, imperfect is start that's not super clear what happens is it's, it's kind of like the genius scientist okay think about the manhattan project and stuff like this but also um there are some other good examples again i was going to talk about this later and we will but this is relevant and we're talking about characters um there's loads of other examples you could think of something like jurassic park um you could think of there's a great very famous doctor who serial uh, the genesis of the Daleks in Doctor Who. Um, and basically what it is, is scientists being so preoccupied with whether or not they can do something and not thinking about whether they should. And that it's only at the end that she has this kind of realization of, you know, shit. Like, I didn't realize where this was basically going. And so I think it's kind of that. She was so, she, she's so into what she is doing and trying to create these perfect things, especially with like the Primarchs and all this kind of stuff. She's so into that, that she can't, she's so blinkered that she doesn't see like the bigger picture. And then when she does, although on the other hand, there is, she talks about, I think she talks about saying like the Emperor can never compromise. Whereas she sometimes maybe sees the need to compromise and that's why she was useful or whatever. She just kind of gets disillusioned, but it, it's not super clear. Um, this is one thing, one of my complaints actually about some of the stuff is that they sometimes don't make it particularly clear enough. Um, there's like also the, the period later where they are dealing with the kind of fire vortex when they're sort of the gene labs, uh, they, they, that's their sort of flashback. And uh, it does describe what happens, but there's, you know, some, I wish they sort of, told a little bit more about the, the the section just before that happens so we know a bit more but there's reasons why they don't do that because of course it plays into again saturnine stuff and and the sort of not knowing we're not supposed to know with certainty some of the details there so that's why um just to mention the name we have uh leora harrod who's this um class tertius technician Simonas talks to Harrod and says uh, uh, the reason Harrod is important is because uh, Simonas uh, says yeah Simonas Simonas talks to this Leora Harrod and says I think it's time that we spoke candidly she basically ends up giving up uh, information about sort of a start and the risks and so on and so on and then yeah the last one we have we've said about already Simonas is this other custodies Custo uh, Simonas is really tasked with monitoring a canned wire and a start and uh, Simonas is he ends up sort of trying to stop a start but he can't and she destroys this project on terror uh, Simonis though survived, uh, but he was, you know, he gets horribly, uh, horribly, horribly injured. He's really smashed up. But uh, Simonis, he was more distraught about failing to secure the uh, genetic law in the dungeon. And Valdor says that he didn't fail, uh, but he doesn't tell him why. Which again, he's like a custodian. He's like, why doesn't he just tell him? So we come to the third section. The three things I wanted to talk about are. Um, first of all, the Thunder Warriors, <clears throat> a little bit about them. Um, we also want to talk about Candawire and sort of her integrity. And we'll talk a little bit, just kind of like how her sort of outlook. Um, and then also Astarte. We want to talk about Amara Astarte a little bit more. We have talked about this a little bit already, so I'll probably be repeating myself a little, but that's because you guys were asking me things ahead of time. So those are my three core themes. So first of all, Thunder Warriors. The whole sphere of this audiobook, the story, is about the killing of the Thunder Warriors. This is this famous event, which is supposedly uh, kind of in Imperial myth, basically, about the Thunder Warriors being killed on Mount Ararat and basically sort of at the command of the Emperor, uh, basically killing all of his own units. So the interesting thing that with this was we learn how it wasn't that they were the Thunder Warriors. We, we learned that they weren't just too violent because that's not really a surprise. And that's always what's said was, oh, they were, they were too unstable and they were too violent. And there's loads of reference to that. Um, well, basically, it's already it's talking about how their genetics was incredibly messed up. Basically, the genetics of the Thunder Warriors were really screwed up. And that was the primary one of the primary reasons, um, because they, they have these very short lifespans. They're very powerful. They're actually sometimes referenced as being slightly more powerful or at least comparable to Space Marines. Um, but yeah, basically they have these short lifespans, they're very powerful, um, but also that sometimes they would just randomly drop dead because their bodies just couldn't handle all the manipulation that had been going on. Um, they might go into like dissociative states or psychotic states of mind. They might just stop following orders. Uh, they might go into random 
barbaric cannibalistic fits and all sorts of other things and as you when we finally get to see them at the end of the story the um, thunder warriors that have survived and you see them at the end when they're confronting Valdor um, it describes about how one of them is like you know they're they're very messed up and they're kind of decaying almost and sort of like falling apart they're like a real mess Valdor notes how they made oh he's talking about the sort of how they were armed as well during this time so Valdor's talking about how they used whatever equipment they had and they would just upgrade it when it was available so basically they're just this kind of hodgepodge mishmash of different gear and when they're trying to test stuff out so they really were just like the kind of test the test dummies really you know but this this has raised this big question for me this is a big question for you guys Nika says question is it known how exactly they were purged custodians were stronger but uh Kategus, uh were more numerous um no they, they don't i mean obviously in the audiobook they don't sp speak to that they don't they don't uh literally give us the description of the, the battle some have said the emperor was there himself but all that really needs to be known is that they just get slaughtered basically then the 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 vast majority of them get killed there but this this big question for me has been would the emperor have wanted to slaughter the space marines who as astarte says are imperfect and we also know some of them have these these flaws with them once he's completed this webway project that we know the emperor was working on so that's my question really for you guys would the emperor have wanted to slaughter the space marines um, there's a lot of hypocrisy also from Valdor uh, early on when he's talking to Simonis about this being a new age of law and uh, and this is what Kandawai wants all the way through she's always talking about this uh, but in the end Valdor basically just says no and kills them all <laughs> which is basically what he told Simonis he wouldn't do in the first place uh, in fact actually uh, Valdor he literally says he literally says I will not succumb to a warlord's urges and nor should you that's Valdor talking to uh, Simonis and at the end of the book they just fucking slaughter everybody <laughs> such hypocrisy this is the thing always with the Imperium absolute hypocrisy yeah I, I've never really thought of the Astartes as being like the finished product because they have got plenty of issues and especially like we're talking about Blood Angels and so on yeah Blood Angels are definitely sort of leaning on the far more damaged than many of the others that's fair, fair to say it is unbelievable the Emperor could be okay <clears throat> with the Night Lords or the World Eaters in their original in the long run they would have had to have been purged. Yeah, I mean that's the thing. Some of the some of the legions who who turned over to Chaos in the end, some of those guys, part of the reason why they turned over really is that they had some pretty sketchy stuff going on. I mean you can and then look at things like um, look at look at the guys like the Word Bearers, you know, and all this kind of stuff. There is a lot of very dodgy things happening. Um, so yeah, it's it's very questionable, um, I think, that they would have allowed them. Also, the idea, to me, was that the, the Space Marines were really... The, the point of the Space Marines was this whole unifying aspect in terms of the Great Crusade, and that after that, their purpose was kind of served. Um, similarly to kind of like the Thunder Warriors, in that the Thunder Warriors, they served the purpose of dealing with the unification on, on Terra, uh, and then after that, they were kind of irrelevant and subsidiary. And and I kind of have had always this impression that the Space Marines were there. The fact that the Space Marines have survived through this massive amount of time is definitely not, I think, what the intention was. Um, and I also think that if the Emperor was going to have this kind of like superhuman force that went on, he would have made another, another iteration. Because I don't think the Space Marines are really... The sort of final deal and i suppose actually it begs the question about um the primaris and kind of what the emperor would think of the primaris i mean they are kind of like replacing the ordinary space marines now but and and actually the whole thing with the primaris actually related to that is kind of interesting because the space marines that there are there now are kind of like being sort of incentivized of like hey you know we need to be stronger and you should want to kind of upgrade you know because a lot of the space means being upgraded now and I, and I do think that kind of goes in line with how the emperors handled things as well anyway so the, and so yes yeah, so there's, there's that happening with the thunder warriors basically my point with the thunder warriors is hypocrisy of valdor in terms of Valdor talking to Simonis and saying, you know, we shouldn't be like the warlords from before. This is a different period in time. And then they just slaughter the Thunder Warriors. Then you have um, Kandawire coming to Valdor and saying, look, you know, I know you guys have killed all these guys. 
what are we going to do about it? But Valdor's like, no, no, no. You know, this is a different time and it's blah, blah, blah. And then he does it again and just kills everybody. You know, so it's just like the, the level of hypocrisy is like amazing. Kandawai. Kandawai and her integrity. So Kandawai's intentions seem good, actually. Uh, I said in the beginning that she seems kind of arrogant and naive and a bit blinkered, and that's true. Um, she, she's kind of, I don't know, she's an odd character. She's kind of likable and not likable. But yeah, so Kandawai, her intentions seem pretty good. In fact, her outlook for the Imperium actually seems to mirror some of the Emperor. And she wants to have progression. She wants to have a better world, really, for humanity overall. And um, she also wants to have this very fair world where you actually have law and accountability and so on. So, like I said, it's interesting that Valdor presents really a facade about, you know, law and order and everything and sort of process and the bureaucracy. You know, he's willing to talk with her and give an interview with her and all this kind of stuff. So he's going through the motions, but he knows it's all nonsense, basically, uh, because at the end of the day, he'll kill. And if the emperor just said kill her, he would do it. I feel like Valdor viewed himself as the necessary evil, not wanting to take such measures. Yeah, Valdor actually talks about that as well. Like he says um, at the end, I think, with like Malkador, and he says, oh, I, I don't like having to have lied to one of the other custodies. So he does have sort of a little bit of sense about that. But it's interesting, I think, to consider this early framing of how the Imperium will operate. It presents itself very often, the Imperium in the early time, of sort of being this very liberating force, you know, oh, we're liberating things, you know, um, as we saw during the Crusade. This is actually, I've said this before, this is actually not dissimilar to the Tau, um, because with the Tau, their whole thing is, they go, the Tau always like to have this air of, oh, we're doing the right thing, and we're just, we're trying to help. We're trying to be helpful and you should join us because then we can help each other. And then the tower like, but if you don't want to agree with us, we're going to wreck you and they'll, then they'll declare war and slaughter you. And so in the early time of the Imperium, it's very similar to this as well. They're basically, I've, sa I've said this many times, despite the age of strife, there are many planets and worlds of humans in the galaxy who are actually doing fine. Uh, they're doing fine. There's loads of civilizations and forge worlds and other things like this that are actually doing fine. And then the Imperium turns up and they basically are like, yeah, you need to join our Imperium or we're going to we're gonna have to fucking wreck you. And it's like, that doesn't feel very liberating to me, you know? Um, but anyway, like I say, it's interesting to hear the sort of early framework in this. So you have the Emperor's vision of humanity and despite the fact that uh, the Emperor would often assign humans these roles, ordinary humans these roles. So, for example, these the, these so-called High Lords of Terror at this time, the Emperor often has this idea that, that um, humans should basically be in charge, but the Emperor is sort of safeguarding and, and building the structure around it for them to sort themselves out. Yeah, the Interrex and so on and so on. Yeah, exactly. The Interrex does show that Kandawai's kind of vision could work, but the Imperium just destroyed them anyway. But again, this idea of humans governing themselves, what is sort of shown here through Kandawai is that this is really a facade. Like, it's kind of for show. And and in the case of Kandawai, it seems really clear. She's actually... Kandawai is actually right. <clears throat> like I said, she's kind of an annoying character. I, I don't really like her demeanor. So she's not a very likable character, but she is correct because they did commit this horrific crime. They slaughtered all the Thunder Warriors, the Thunder Warriors who not only had they allowed themselves to be kind of manipulated, but also that had to endure all this, you know, years of fighting, basically. Um, and, then they, and then they just killed them all. Uh, so she, she's correct. It was like a, a horrific crime committed. And Valdor, dis, despite the fact that Valdor kind of grants her an audience and he wants to chat and so on and so on, Valdor, he really basically patronizes her. He's really condescending. And he essentially just kind of nods her along. You know, she's asking all these questions and he's just kind of giving her information. Because uh, he knows the outcome is never going to be what she wants. Like, she's she's never going to, like, convict a custodies and what would even happen then. It's, it's comical because she even knows this. But she does kind of have the courage to sort of see the process through. In her mind, she's kind of like, this is what I'm supposed to do even though she knows it's kind of like a sham, basically. It's just kind of interesting, the dynamic, I think. This is obviously the main whole crux of the story here, and I just really like it. Chris says, why Why did he spare her then? I think it's very clear why uh, Valdor spares Kandawire. It's basically because 
she she has stayed true to her sort of she, her integrity, which is what we're talking about, uh, Candomai's integrity. She she knows that this whole thing is just a nonsense and a sham, but she sort of sees it through. And the whole thing of them having like this kind of rebellion and almost trying to have like a coup and sort of take over the palace. Yeah, you could argue she's kind of turned against them. You could argue that. But I think it's more like she feels like her hand is kind of forced. I don't think she went there with the intention of like burning down the palace or anything. <clears throat> I think she went there with because she wanted to sort of bring them to account for what they had done. Because remembering that they're really in the wrong, Valdor and the Custodes and the Emperor, they're really in the wrong for kind of slaughtering the Thunder Warriors. So she's really just kind of thinking, well, I've been given this responsibility what am I going to do about it? She could just roll over and say, okay, whatever, just stop asking questions. But she thinks, no, like, they've told me this is what my role is, and I'm going to do it. Kind of respect for that. Question, she definitely didn't have any idea about the Thunder Warriors needed to be ended with their genetic flaws and all. I, I think actually what Kandamai would say, what her argument would be, would be if that were to be the case, then it should be discussed. She wants things to be an open discussion. You know, like you have the High Lords. I think basically her argument would be if the, if the Thunder Warriors need to be destroyed, then Valdor should come to the High Lords. They should discuss it and then collectively decide this is an action which needs to happen, not circumvent and, and sort of override them, basically. I think that's her whole, her whole issue there. Uh, my question is, do we think that the Emperor would have potentially rewarded Kandawire were he there himself for kind of having the courage of her conviction and for sort of having this very you know integrity view i think that's interesting also i, I put here at the end valdor says an army conquers and an administration rules it's that weird sort of you know valdor comes out and he says these things but it's like it's bollocks <laughs> You know, he, uh, Valdor has these very sort of prophetic things that he comes out with and says, but it's actually bollocks. Like, it's like he'll say this and then he'll actually do something else. It depends if he wants humans to rule, if it's a facade. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. It depends what you believe, really, doesn't it? You know, what does the emperor want? Does he really want humans to rule? Or is that just a way, you know, sort of way to kind of get people to go along with him? I think he would have appreciated that she was performing her... I mean, I think it's kind of a waste. I think it's kind of a waste. You know, you've got Kandawar, and, and she seems, like, pretty committed to the role of what she's doing. She seems pretty... She seems to have, like, this very powerful integrity about her position as well. Like, she takes it really seriously. And also, you get this impression of her kind of falling into the role. Like, she doesn't really understand... Like, she doesn't really get... You know, she actually talks about this a bit, I think. She sort of says about how she's a bit kind of confused, like, how she ended up getting this position. But it's because Malkador, I think, sort of saw something in her. Or I think it's, I think that's right. This is what is I kind of find weird. Like, they give her this position. They tell her what to do. And then she does it. And they basically say, well, hang on, hang on. We didn't want you to do that. <laughs> and it's like... And then they don't even give her the information she needs to be able to properly put it all into context. So what the hell? Like, she's kind of screwed right from the start. Like, it's a nonsense. So I, I kind of feel like she really got dealt a rough hand, Valdor has internalized Imperial propaganda. I mean, it, it kind of feels that way, doesn't it? I can't decide if the Emperor is a deceiving tyrant or a cold-blooded ruler thinking about greater mankind. Yeah, the Emperor is still, to me, a really big enigma. Like, I still haven't figured out really an opinion on him. Which always surprises people. I think people always expect me to have, like, this really defined opinion. But it's like, how can you? There's a lot of stuff going on with, like, how Gilman sort of talks about how the Emperor is different. Um, we have Erda throwing a load of stuff in the mix. And there's so many, I mean, there's so many references I could go off on. But yeah, I mean, like, as I have highlighted through some of my videos, by and large, the Emperor does come across as a bit of a dick. He, I mean, he just does. Like, the things he does and the decisions he makes, it, it just seems like a bit of an hour. Like, and and you, you, have to, you have to presume it's in the, it's in the, the aim of something greater. You know, it's, in, it's in the, he's got the goal of something much greater going on. You have to assume that. But, you know, it's hard to see sometimes. <laughs> so. The thing with Astarte, I think the reason, we were talking about the reason why she decides to, like, break her laboratory and so on. The main reason why I think Astarte kind of goes off the rails is the, the loss of the 20 Primarchs. So the Primarchs, you know, the whole thing falls down, the Primarchs have disappeared and so on and so on. And I think that's kind of, it breaks her resolve, you know. We hear about the Fire Vortex, which is meant to have scattered them, although was that 
just a cover story. Valdor relives this uh, thinking about how it's the worst day of his life when the um, the Primarchs were sort of scattered or taken. This whole section is pretty vague where they're talking about the sort of the, the laboratory being destroyed. Because whilst they talk about the very active process, there's very few specific details about actually what happened. Now, like I said, I'm sure that, that is by design because and, and, the, and there also is a very there's a very interesting uh, law contradiction with this section. But I'll talk about that later. Yeah, Astarte, she's significantly fearful. She talks about the Astartes being an end and a means, okay? And how the weapon, she also talks about how the weapon shouldn't be greater than the user. She, I think, wasn't happy already. She's pissed off that the Primarchs basically get taken and it's like how life works. She she thinks that the, the, the Primarchs are like the linchpin. They're the, the keystone. And without them, the whole bridge falls down. Okay, so Astarte, she already thinks it's over with. She thinks the whole thing's messed up and screwed and done already. She she already thinks it's a, like ruined. And then not only that, but then I think it sort of breaks her. The fact that the project kind of gets interfered with, I think at that point, it kind of breaks her out of what she's been focused on. That's my interpretation. And she starts to sort of really realize what they're doing. And I think she has this this horrifying realization that actually maybe this is not the best thing to do but it's kind of way too late at that point. Astarte, she doesn't really have a particularly strong background or origin story either. She grows up just as kind of like a, a naturally sort of talented, I guess, person towards science. Uh, so she just kind of has like a, a, a strong natural ability, I guess. And she's on this, the war plagued of terror. Um, she's just plying her trade to the warlords. So she's just using her intelligence to survive, basically. I think actually a killer, he talks about that a little earlier. So Astarte, basically, she's surviving by using her trait uh, skills and things. I actually would have liked them to focus less on Astarte when she's in the laboratory and more in the earlier time for her. Uh, and there are some other books that reference her and so on and so on. So anyway, eventually the emperor finds her. Um, oh yeah, she also, she's found out some, maybe some dark age technology, sort of knowledge in terms of genetics, I guess. Um, and that's how she's been sort of crafting some superhuman soldiers and so on and so on a little bit. Uh, yeah, the Emperor finds her and she sees that the Emperor is far greater than the warlords that she's been serving. So she goes along with him. Uh, but it's important to say, I guess, that the Emperor, uh, you know, like I said, he can already do genetic manipulation. He has other scientists already, like Erda. And, and Emar uh, just happens to be another one of these. But she's just more adept than, than most others. But Astarte, she really seems to fit the mould, like I was saying, a lot before about this scientist being obsessed just with the pure science of achievement and that she's not really stopped to think about the consequences and that that's that's what kind of catches up with her in the end but in the end after it all Astarte appears you know everything that she's kind of done and also even her attempt to destroy it ends up seeming kind of futile uh, her efforts overall are just kind of moot which is kind of I guess depressing for her but it's kind of you know, she does, she does turn on the Emperor and try to destroy everything. I think within the wider context, while Astarte, which was obviously brilliant in doing what she did, Belisarius Call uh, appears to be a slightly more important figure, but not in necessarily the later time. The name of the character that Belisarius Call was before he was Belisarius Call. Yeah, Ezekiel Sedane. Because Sedane is basically uh, the, 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 the stronger genius, really. And he talks about this a lot, you know. Uh, you wonder if it's kind of the kind of person who just talks himself up a lot, right? But yeah, Sedane, Sedane contributes a very large amount. Yeah, there was something that I think it was like the black carapace, and Astarte she couldn't get it she couldn't get it working. Like she's tried really hard and she couldn't get it working. And Sedane was the one who actually uh, ended up fixing the this sort of black carapace situation. Astarte is mainly kind of associated because of her name, and she did do all this work. But I think actually in the wider picture, and considering the fact that she even turns against the emperor. She should be viewed as a kind of, I think, slightly contemptuous character. I think it's mainly fearful. She kind of fears, like, what have I done? What have I created? She she created the Black Carapace, but she couldn't get it to integrate. Like, it kept failing. And so Ezekiel Sedane, who was another Gene Wright scientist, actually got it working. Again, it's in the uh, another one. I actually, I, I'm, I'm tempted to listen to for one of our future audiobooks, perhaps even the next one. I'm kind of tempted to listen to the great work with Belisarius Call, because I, I love that. It's a really good uh, story. But Valdor notes, for all I just said, there is there is a big positive with um, Astarte, which is that 26 years prior to the events, when basically the scattering, uh, when all the, the Primarchs got scattered, Valdor specifically says 
about how Astarte was invaluable. He says uh, she was saving the Astarte's project when it was consumed in the fire and destruction, uh, and that without Astarte, considerably more stuff would have been lost because she knows they're in this time where like the laboratory is collapsing and it's all on fire, and obviously there's people going crazy because of their possessed or whatever. Basically, she knows what where to go, the stuff to get, because at that time, obviously here at the end later, we know, oh, you know, they've they've duplicated everything, so it doesn't matter that Astarte destroys all the labs. But in this in, in the first time here, that hadn't happened. So Astarte was important because she saved the stuff they needed to save. And if she hadn't have saved that stuff, then they genuinely would have lost like a lot of work. Um, so that was kind of important. Somebody said earlier why why they called Astartes if if she's such a problematic character. So I, I actually think this is kind of disturbing. And Malkador talks about it. He says, if any soul outside of our circle of steel knew that we had taken copies of this copies of the Astartes, genetic stuff, and lifted them to Luna already, the remaining caches uh, would have been placed uh, in genuine peril. It had to look real, and as you say, Astarte acted on her own volition. She could have pulled back. But her name remains on the project documents, says Valdor. Um, as, and then Malkador says, as far as I know, a mild irony. He seems to enjoy those. So yeah, it's, it's this whole thing with the Emperor. He's, he decides to leave the name of Astarte on everything, despite the fact, uh, all the problems and uh, the fact that she's kind of turned against them as this sort of ironic joke that the Emperor has. And it is what I like about the fact that the Emperor leaves the name is it reveals a lot about the Emperor's character, that he's actually quite human. Because only a human person could enjoy the sort of bleak comedy of allowing, you know, the project name to remain when the person that is being referenced to not only had turned against you, but whose sort of belief in the project had also been systematically crushed and she was disillusioned by it. So it's it's a really kind of sick joke. But again, I like this mainly because it does actually sit in line with what I think of as the sort of the bleak dark humor you know often because obviously 40k is supposed to be this very sort of bleak it's it's supposed to be like this dark comedy a lot of people say no 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 that's not the case anymore 40k is much more serious now and you guys know I, I love to take it seriously I probably take it seriously than a great deal of people but I think it's very clear that Warhammer 40k it's supposed to be I, I, I've said it before I, I find it impossible that you could not consider 40k to be insane. Like, just look at the stuff. Look at the stuff that happens. It's mad. It's dark and bleak, and it is like there's a lot of dark. There's a lot of dark humor in it. Like, like the like we were saying earlier. Okay, the perfect example. The perfect example is the exemplars. Like I was saying earlier, you know, it builds up the exemplars and how they're like this this fantastic thing, and like they're the you know they're these special units that Astarte has created, and they get shredded, like. <laughs> <laughs> it's absolutely hilarious you know I, I was literally laughing i think when i was when i heard some of those bits you know it's a nonsense so anybody that says oh no, no. i mean i will say warhammer 40k uh, it's changed a little because i think that was the, the sort of dark comedy nonsense of it was a bit more prevalent uh, back in the day over time it's changed a little bit and there's there's more seriousness to it and i think also i think also you can disconnect certain things okay so it doesn't have to all be like one and the same okay the more serious writing side of it in terms of the no novels the heresy series and all this other stuff you can definitely take them seriously because they're written in a serious tone you know and and I think that's definitely supposed to be the way. However, at the same time, like you look at you look at this, there's definitely stuff in here that's supposed to be kind of funny. Not though in a ha ha kind of way, just in a like that's messed up, and it's kind of like a wink and a nod of like look how screwed up everything is. But there's there's loads of insane stuff that's like so insane it's clearly meant to be sort of silly. The whole thing with Celestine having to like climb this mountain of bones. She's having to climb over the, all these bones are like her own corpses from her previous deaths. <laughs> There's loads of things that are like this that are completely insane. 40k is a mad thing. Amara Astarte gets her name left on the Astartes for literally no other reason than the Emperor's like basically saying like, yeah, fuck you. <laughs> he could have changed it. At that time, nobody knew what an Astartes was. So the Emperor's just like, nah, nah, we'll keep it. <laughs> it's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Okay. So we're talking now about the kind of end sections of the book. 
basically tying it all together. So the last few chapters, last few sections, basically. First of all, Space Marines. At the end, we have the Space Marines come in. And uh, <clears throat> they basically, you have this bit of battle at the end. The Space Marines basically just smash through Kandawai's forces and the remaining uh, Thunder Warriors that have survived. Yes, they're, they're noted as sort of having the, the Dark Angel's sword wings, I think. Uh, it's obviously supposed to be. Grey armor, as they did in the beginnings. And despite the fact that they've had no experience in fighting, they still absolutely fuck them up. Like, <laughs> like there, there's, there's, no, there's no balance in this situation. Yeah, it is a very epic uh, scene where, like, they're just coming out of... Because remember, up on the mountaintop here in the palace, it's all, like, snowy and blizzard and a storm happening and all this kind of stuff. And then basically, like, you just see all these red lights, the eyes uh, of, of course, the space classic Space Marine helmets. If you imagine that scene within the context of, like, the visual from, from on YouTube, uh, uh, Startes, uh, with, the, with the way that that animation series is done in that kind of visual style if you imagine it more seriously it's an epic scene but it can go either way that's the thing with these kind of stuff in 40k you know you can imagine it's super serious or it could be like a complete nonsense and it's just like you know they're, they're absolutely smashing them but for that scene really that's all that kind of needs saying because that scene is over and in you're back to Kandoa, Ush, uh, Ushtan and Valdor having a chit chat Whilst in the background, like uh, the way I the way I imagine that scene, they're all there and they're having their little discuss. Meanwhile, in the background, everyone's just getting absolutely smashed. <laughs> so they're like standing up here, like having their little chit chat. Okay, so come back to Kandawire again. So essentially, here now, Kandawire, she was in a tricky situation. So the other High Lords, they had roles that were sort of more not necessarily civilian. They wouldn't have ended up in the same situation that she found herself in. I guess is the point. She was specifically given the role of carrying out justice and, and order, basically. But it was unfortunate that nobody bothered to tell her that that only went up as far as the Custodes and Malkador, and that they could do whatever they wanted. She kind of failed to get the memo about that one, uh, which is kind of sad because, like I said, she's actually also brave enough to stand up to Valdor, how could she possibly have been expected to know the bigger picture when they didn't tell her? It's almost like Valdor sort of talks about how he's sort of disappointed and she could have chosen a different path and he gave her every opportunity and blah, blah. And again, even that seems like a non you know, that seems like bullshit to me. Because it's like, how is she supposed to know all this stuff? You know, these huge things that are happening that are way out the realm of her, her sphere of knowledge. And Valdor's just like, well, you know, you should have figured that one out. And it's like, how? How is she supposed to figure this out? But, but it's comical as well because of just how wrong she is. She has this mad idea that the custodians were wanting to like usurp power or cling to power and, and sort of create like a dictatorship sort of military state, which of course, you know, in the bigger picture, that's what's happening. But she's imagining it more kind of tangibly, I guess, more literally between them, which is bizarre that she thought it would be anything else than that, really. You know, it's like it's with the way everything's happening. It's strange that she thinks that that that's it's going to be anything else. She seems really confused, to be honest, just about also what the custodies are, because she projects all these intentions onto Valdor, things that he's really clearly incapable of, you know, like all of his sort of feelings and so on and so on. She projects kind of like human sort of attitudes when it's very clear that they're nothing like this okay valdo describes to us how he says uh, some ancient patterns were not adopted uh, there was never a democratic mandate for the world it was too perilous to allow the masses to sway the direction of travel uh, this was always a dictatorship headed by a single individual but with the promise of a benign governance at its heart the high lords were not figureheads and nor were they powerless he's talking to kandawai uh, he says, as the Emperor swept across the old ruined continents at the head of its enhanced armies, it fell to them to allocate scarce resources, to oversee the operations of law enforcers, to reconstruct all that had been willfully cast aside by more slipshod generations. So basically, Valdor is saying the High Lords were meant to focus on what was happening below and not what was happening above. And that was Kandawai's big mistake, that she was, she was too committed to her role and, and certainly more than a little bit naive. And Valdor, he even like mocks her really badly at one point. And basically he says like she's a naive fool. And Valdor says, uh, with respect, High Lord, you brought the bloodshed. The death this night will be on your conscience. And uh, Ushtan says, conscience, 
He's like, um, so you can remember what it's like to have one of those, can you? And Kandawai, she says, uh, stand aside, Captain General. Tell them to open the gates. Your trial will be in accordance with the Lex. And if you're innocent, then you have nothing to fear. And uh, Valdor just says, innocent, guilty. I did not think to hear such facile terms from a high lord. Um, and then he says, we're the architects of the species' future. No crime could be judged as too heinous if it secured that. No virtue could be forgiven if it hindered it. The Lex is a tool for the control of the psychologically free. Uh, it is an expression of his will and nothing more. You have been a fool to think that it is more than that. You could have served long and honourably as its protector, and now your fate is chained to theirs. So he's talking about the Thunder Warriors and all the rest. And Kandawai, she holds her ground. And then you have Ushatan come in, and uh, Ushatan's laughing. He says, now then, be nice. She has a point. You're a lying, murdering bastard, and we're all supposed to be cracking down on them. He says, you could give her what she wants, and you won't have to watch your city burn. I, I, li I like the twin things happening there, basically. You have Valdor trying to have this very... He always talks in this very prophetic way. You know, he's trying to make these very sort of like these grand statements and you have Kandawaya who's playing it absolutely straight and she thinks like she's in the right and she's you know she really believes he should step down and they should deal with this and da -da. when Valdor kind of mocks her and he says oh you're a naive fool you should have realized Kandawaya you should have realized your job was supposed to be looking down on the little plebs and, and making sure everything stayed in good order while we did all the important stuff Stain says, a question near the end, Valdor is speaking to Malkador and says uh, his human sentiments, they're still ebbing, referring to Emperor calling the Primarchs his sons. What is he referring to? Uh, that's way too vague, yeah, I couldn't tell you. There is this ongoing thing with the Emperor where when Gilliman goes back to him, it's sort of suggested that the Emperor has lost a lot of his humanity and so on and so on. There's loads of things that the Emperor has to do which take loads of his psychic power as well. I don't know, you could speculate that perhaps it just takes its toll on the Emperor. You know, that he basically loses more and more of his humanity as he goes along because of all the it's sort of he's having to kind of put so much of himself into everything especially from a psychic point of view you know it's no wonder that later down the line when Gunnarman comes back to him and he's been on the throne all this time that like it's you know he's like a shell of a person Valdor we see Ushtan and Valdor uh, Ushtan is the uh, Primarch Thunder Warrior they engage in this duel and Valdor uh, still Valdor has he has, has, has great respect for Ushtan and he tries to give the Primarch every opportunity to not take this path finally uh, as he moves to kill him the Primarch says how he's always felt uh, very sorry for Valdor uh, he says the Thunder Warriors while only having short lives know their value in themselves basically as being human Whereas Valdor has had all the humanity and the emotion genetically like erased out of himself. And this leaves uh, almost really a, a shell of a person. He doesn't say that. This is what I've put, written. Uh, and Valdor basically agrees um, hilariously. Uh, they sort of discuss also how uh, the Astartes may face the same fate as the Thunder Warriors. And then Valdor stabs him through the heart. I really love the, the, the last kind of interactions between Ushtan and Valdor because... Basically, Ushtan's like throwing all this shit at Valdor and telling him like, you suck, you're like a, you're like a broken shell of a person, you're dead inside, like he's throwing all this crap at him. And then, and then Valdor basically is like, yeah, that, that's fair. And then just kills him. <laughs> the one thing I want to talk about is, I, I've, I've put the t my subtitle here as Sad Custodies. What you come to is this this realization, and you see a few people had said like, oh, you know, Valdor, he doesn't come into this story enough, and and some of you guys, when I asked in the beginning, you said, um, you know, do you feel like Valdor is in the story enough? And several people said, no, no, you know, Valdor, he doesn't appear enough in the story. But I think that's actually the point. I think people get caught up in the the idea of this sort of grandiose idea of what the custodians are, um, <clears throat> these sort of best of the best of the best. Uh, you know, and they're so good, and they have the gold armor, and they, you know, all this kind of stuff. I actually think the Kasodis are kind of sad characters, actually. I don't think they're, like, so amazing. They're obviously, like, amazing in terms of their skill. There is some slight contradiction in the lore between the impression that you can get from them here and other impressions where it talks about them being scholars and artisans, the, the direct opposite of what's kind of implied here. So, yeah, the Kasodis, they're kind of sad figures to me because they're often shown to be, like I say, these glorious... Sort of powerful true representations of the ultimate human warrior but in actuality once you peel away all the armor they're kind of like i say a bit tragic they only have one really passionate feeling and that's to be these absolutely unbreakably loyal 
to the emperor, defend him in the palace, you know, that's their whole thing. So as Kandawai reveals, like by talking to Valdor and all this sort of stuff, they're kind of dead inside. They don't really have a lot of feelings. Um, they don't seem to have strong feelings about certain things really one way or the other. And this is often sort of alluded to uh, when they're talking about the need for these symbolic over-the-top suits of armor and all the other visual stuff that goes on with the Imperium, that the, all the visual is kind of basically like a facade. And I'm sure, you know, for some people, the idea that the custodies are these kind of sad figures, that, to be honest, they're almost kind of like brainwashed servants a little bit to me. Not an outlook that I think some people would want, because I know some people love the custodies. But I think from Valdor here, like I, I love, I love the character of Valdor. Like I, I have, I have the model. You know, I've got to paint it soon. Uh, I love the character of Valdor. Don't get me wrong. Um, but I, I think they're more tragic than people often portray them as. The other thing is that I think that actually fits perfectly. I think it fits absolutely with the Emperor and the Imperium that they're these ultimate glorious gold warriors, but they're actually kind of dead husks inside. I think that fits absolutely perfectly for the Imperium. Okay, Valdo and Kanda, they do have a bit of a final discuss as well that brings an end to their story. Kanda I laughed watching the ranks of warriors trudge past her. But I wasn't wrong, was I? She said dryly. This is the future, the Senatorum, the Lex. It's all a front. These are the faces of the Imperium now. And uh, Valdor says, conquest remains. Uh, she says, where? The globe is all but in the Emperor's hand. And he says, there's more to the Emperor's ambition than terror. This is just the start. Already the ships are being built that will carry this army into the stars. And Valdor says, come now, did you really think the Emperor was still fighting warlords? Luna is next. There are gene scientists there, ones who can turn these thousands into hundreds of thousands. That is the task now, the one that must not fail. In future years, perhaps we'll be able to indulge debates over the niceties of the law. But for now, and for all days, I can clearly foresee the task is survival. If that requires a few gentle myths of choice, of determination, and so be it. Kandawai says, uh, takes that in. And she says, you can tell yourself that. She says, it may even seem right to you, but a myth will spin out of control. You let these things run loose now, you'll not be able to rein them in later. I believed in unity. And Valdor says, you still should. Kandawai says, but what is it then? How are you different from all the others except in power? And Valdor reaches up, activating his helm seals, pulls the Oromite mask. He looks Kandavai with somber eyes, uh, letting the sleet run down his face. He says, because we are a necessity. He said, we stand between ignorance and annihilation. To prevent the latter, we enforce the former. It is a bitter draft and one you have been schooled to hate, but it must be swallowed. Kandawai looked up at him defiantly. She says, I will not believe that. Valdor says, I admire your persistence. I love this. I love that her absolute, like, un breakable determination to like get it out of him even though he's told her you're a fool you're you're an ignorant naive and despite it she doesn't let it go and at the end she says what happened on mount ararat she knows what happened she says what happened and valdor says what good can knowing that do now and she says i want to hear it from your lips just once the truth and valdor says the truth to be worth anything it must be preserved Within a lifetime, no one will know the name Ushtat, even though he was greater than most of those who will take the credit for building this Imperium. It matters not what is done by who to whom unless it is remembered, so I can give you nothing here, High Lord, nothing of any worth, for what you ask is destined to be forgotten. And then she calls him a coward and Valdor's like, whatever. But I really enjoy this. Uh, it's a really good ending for Kando and Valdor because he really like slams the door on her idealistic sort of outlook uh, when he just says I could tell you the truth but why bother because in a thousand years nobody's going to care who died up on a mountaintop and I really think that is the most underscoring takeaway from this story because it really is this sense of what the Imperium is about doing whatever is necessary in the moment no matter the cost because in the bigger picture that's all that matters for humanity to endure. For Kandawai, it's kind of become like bigger than whatever she originally wanted to do. Like at the end, she just wants him to say, yeah, we did it. But he won't, like he won't say it. That's basically the whole of the story. Valdor basically tells Kanda, hey, look, you can go off and you can, you know, you, we're not going to kill you. We're not going to execute you. He basically tells Kanda, he's killed uh, Ushatan, they've killed everybody. But he basically says to Kanda, like, you can go on, you can go and live your life. Because um, he kind of realizes, although she's kind of orchestrated all this nonsense, she's just been doing her best, and she has she's not she didn't really set out to like bring down what they're doing. 
She was fairly honourable, laudable, basically, I think. So he basically says, go on, you can go still live, but like, what kind of life? We'll talk about that. So the last thing I want to come and kind of say about is just Malkador at the end here. Um, Malkador, who finally arrives back on Terra. Uh, apparently he was with uh, the Emperor on Luna. Uh, the Emperor is ever, uh, he just wants the Crusade now. He wants to deal with the Selenar to enable them to create these hundreds of thousands of space marines. He also tells Valdor, and Malkador tells Valdor, the Emperor believes the Primarchs are still alive and can be found. Valdor says uh, they're probably corrupted and uh, he can't understand why the enemy, talking about chaos, would spare them. And Malkador says the enemy likes to play games, meaning like they're probably some are okay. Uh, they note also that uh, Starty's efforts will cause almost no issues, which is hilarious. They talk about, well, they've copied all the genetic stuff, so they don't, that's not a big deal. Uh, they note the Emperor is eager to install the first webway matrix where her, where her lab used to be as well. And then finally we hear how construction of the palace is going uh, well, but it needs a throne. This is this loud track that I skipped earlier. And then also lastly, of course, we've got the epilogue. Uh, this is the tragic piece, I think, where we see Ofar, who is Kandawai's assistant. And we see Kandawai, she goes back <coughs> to her original town where she grew up. And she sees that it's kind of desolate and, you know, there's nothing really for her there. And Kandawai, she kind of goes back to living like kind of peasants, slum living really. And because of what? Because she had the audacity to call out the correct fact that slaughtering your own forces was basically wrong. And I think it's actually, I actually think it's pretty depressing ending. You have all the kind of bigger picture grandiose stuff with Malkador and, you know, Luna and they're moving on to do their next thing. But I, but I think it's kind of, I think it's quite a depressing ending. So that's really uh, all I've got for the main body of it. I really enjoy this, which is obviously why I picked it. I really enjoy the story. Um, I think it's also a little different uh, because it doesn't have fucking space marines all over the place. Uh, <laughs> but uh no i really like the story because i think it sheds a lot of interesting light on um the setup for what's to come i really like the sort of i want to kind of listen to it again this week actually because i i want to go back over some of the wording of, of kanda and valdor and it's like they both have the same thing in terms of like their strength of integrity and belief about everything but they're just coming at it from totally different directions she's a very unlikable likable character her, her demeanor is kind of grating she's kind of arrogant and presumptuous she seems to be trying to hit like a square peg through a round hole she even says like oh she knows that she's not going to get anything out of valdor but she just kind of feels obligated to do it and i but, but i just kind of like that i like that i like that she has the sort of bottle to kind of be like yeah I know this is a total waste of time and could have serious consequences, but it's what you got to do. <clears throat> and she just kind of goes with it. And I kind of like that. Oh, Nick has said, what would it all mean? Um, well, well, the epilogue, I mean, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So there was, yeah, okay. The one thing I didn't mention, uh, there is this piece in the epilogue where it's, it's like somebody basically traveling on a, a starship. And they basically, I think they have like a recording device. <clears throat> I didn't note this down because I don't think it's particularly relevant. I don't think it's super important, which is why I didn't make a big mention of it where you see an associate of a uh, of um Kandwire, and they've obviously got the recordings that she's done with valdor because remember all the way through this uh she's recording Val she says to valdor can i record and uh, he's fine with that and at the end you see someone i guess not Kandwire, one of her assistants or whatever is leaving the planet and they've got this recording I guess the implication is that they're going to do something dramatic with this recording. Except for the fact that by the time we know, by the time of M41, there's like nothing's happened with that. And that that is also, it's another bleak end to the story, I guess, for me. Because it kind of validates Valdor. Because uh, Valdor says about how, you know, he's not going to bother to tell her the truth because it's irrelevant. Because nobody's going to give a shit, basically. Like, yeah, they killed all these people, but whatever. He's like, in a hundred years, who's going to care? And so even though she makes this big deal about having the recording, and, and clearly, like, I think when that recording is going off the planet, Kandawai, she's obviously made a big effort to get it away, you know? As if it's, like, some secret thing which is going to, like, unravel everything. And in reality, it's just like, nah, nothing happens. Nothing happens, it's fine. <laughs> so, I, again, that's I, I think there's not really much to tell about that part because I don't really think there's there's much about it. For me, anyway, I think it's just meant to be, like, a last kind of bleak wink you know like yeah you know you know nothing's going to come of it could well be that it's just leaving the door open for the potential for that to become something later down the line but i don't really see it i suppose you could argue that oh maybe if space moon's got hold of it then they could be like what the fuck you know like the emperor killed our own forces it, it would just get spun or rationalized i don't think it would really become to a big deal 
Uh, what happened to Valdor? Uh, Valdor is classically uh, missing in action. Like so many characters in 40k, Valdor is like missing. So, you know, not dead. Just not there. There is a weird lore conflict in this story, which I had the presence of mind to bother to go and add in because I knew some of them would ask about it. Basically, okay, in the book, uh, the Heresy series book, uh, Deliverance Lost, uh, of course, you only would know this if you've gone through the Heresy books. In Deliverance Lost, so it is basically the aftermath of Istvan V, where there were obviously like all the traitors and they had that big slaughter, and uh, the Raven Guards did poorly and they got smashed pretty hard. So, Raven Guard uh, Legion, uh, Korax, Primarch Korax, he wants to rebuild the Legion. Uh, but in order to do this, he needs to have a sort of genetic material and so on. And the ability, the know-how to do it. So basically, uh, Korax in the book, he gets into an argument with Dawn, Rogel Dawn, and Malkador because he wants to see the Emperor to talk about this. Uh, but the Emperor is doing other stuff. But the Emperor sort of picks up on this and uh, he psychically communicates through Malkador uh, to implant in Korax's mind the memories that he needs to locate and secure this genetic material to find the technology left over from the Primarch project. Okay, Now in Valdor, uh, you remember that in Valdor it describes how the Primarch project gets destroyed but more specifically. Uh, so basically, I'll just read the rest of this that I've written about Korax. So Korax, he goes back to Terra, and they want to use this um, technology from the Primarch Project to rebuild the Raven Guard by rapidly making new Space Marines. Not just making, because remember, it takes a while to make Space Marines. Um, so they want to do this very quickly. So Korax and the Guard that go with him, uh, they oh yeah, there's some custodies go along and some Mechanicum genitors, like bi bio Biologus. And Korax for the Raven Guard, they all go to Terra and they go to this place called the Labyrinth, which is this really complex underground maze made by the Emperor to protect the Primarch project, basically. The idea that the Primarch project is still there and you need this whole labyrinth to get to it because it needs protecting from whoever. And it's this maze created by the Emperor. So despite having some losses, Korax can command his forces into the right spots at the right time to overload the labyrinth uh, ra it's randomly changing mechanism because it's very complex and so on. It jams it open so they can get to the Primarch project and the Raven Guard then return to the Deliverance world uh, with it. And that's the whole thing with that book. The problem with that is that it conflicts pretty severely with what is described in Valdor because in Valdor it talks about the collapsing of that laboratory. It talks about this huge fire vortex when the Primarch project was scattered um, it talks very specifically about the deep sections where the Primarch elements were contained being consumed in fire. But not only that, uh, Valdor talks about how the Emperor is the only thing holding the entire facility together and that the entire structure then begins to subside once they've got what they needed to and that if it weren't for the Emperor, it would be just like destroyed rubble. Those two things are a pretty severe conflict. Rationalize however you want. I always say, you know, like when it comes to the law, nothing's set in stone, simultaneous things can exist, right? We don't know necessarily that the Emperor maybe didn't go back and dig stuff out and fix that place up a little bit. Maybe he realized like, hey, I'm going to actually need that stuff later down the line and maybe we need to get in there and sort it out. You could perhaps argue that the, the, the Primarch stuff is described as being much lower down in the facility and that it gets consumed by fire. You could argue that potentially maybe the stuff which was much lower down didn't take so much damage and that the rest of it on top got crushed. Whatever you want. There's ways to rationalize it. Face value, it's a pretty severe conflict. So that's a kind of curious one. Yeah, exactly. There's, 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 there's some small room for error because uh, Atarius just says, Valdor says, the floors above and below were sealed. One small thing that I saw uh, that I thought was interesting, not really a big mystery or anything, just interesting. Simonus notes when he's in the sort of genetic laboratory stuff, he says that many of the genetic vaults have got these symbols above them. One is of a blood drop surrounded by wings of a hawk. Another is a thunderbolt. Another is a wolf head. So what's interesting about that, I think, is that it shows that very early on, it, it confirms the fact that the Emperor knew that the Primarchs would have certain traits associated with them, um, like Sanguinius and like um, Lehman Russ. So I think that's kind of interesting that they've already had these icons designated for them. Because some people have sometimes said, oh, you know, maybe some of these traits and so on 
kind of like were unknowns and that they didn't anticipate that they were going to be a thing and i think that little bit right there that basically dispels any idea that they didn't know exactly what they were doing yeah the last thing this is actually good to finish on actually like, uh, the whole thing is to do with this hypocrisy of valdor uh, Kandawire pushing him on that all the time so this maul and sen was this battle where they have to fight against these weird entities the thunder warriors it's it's hinted at that it's like chaos manipulation and valdor when he's talking about maul and sen Valdor says how the humans there had found access to some Dark Age technology, that they'd used it to create these bizarre creations. It's alluded to that they're sorceress, whatever you want to read into that. But like I said, this whole, the whole thing of Birth of the Imperium, Kandawire and Valdor, it's all to me about mainly the hypocrisy of Valdor. There's loads of things Valdor does in this in terms of hypocrisy saying on the one hand when we shouldn't do this it's a, we're a different age you know we've got we've got laws and stuff now we, we're not like the barbarians we just go about and then they just slaughter everybody anyway and so this is another example of that valdor's talking about the weird things that these these people at maul and sen have created the results were despicable we were fighting men stitched together into mockeries of the human form, some were encased in machines and goaded into war with pain amplifiers. Most of those we encountered to one degree or another had been shaped into new forms, swapping their dignity for a feral kind of strength. That is hilarious, because yet again, it's this amazing hypocrisy. Now, to be fair to Valdor, he couldn't necessarily have seen so far into the future, but what he's describing here and he's describing about these horrific things. It's so comical. When the Imperium later, you have Arcoflagellants, you have the Penitent Engines, all these kind of absolutely messed up things. And here's Valdor saying, you know, the results were despicable. He's like, the Imperium would never do that. And it's like, fast forward. I enjoy the sort of uh, the dichotomy between Valdor and uh, Kandawire, and I like their relationship. But I, I, I think Kandawire, like, she maybe doesn't realize it, but she actually reveals a lot about the Imperium and Valdor, and that actually what she did was important. And we learn a lot from her investigation. That's kind of the point, I think. If she didn't bother to make the effort, you wouldn't know any of it. It's still at the end of it, it's kind of bleak and slightly depressing because it, you know, it very much has this theme of it's all pointless, it's a waste of time. You know, Astarte, she tries to make this big thing, waste of time. Kandawai, she tries to make this big effort, waste of time. It's this idea of the unstoppable Imperium and that nothing can stop it. Nothing can stop the Emperor. It's just rolling on. And if you get in the way, you're just going to get absolutely crushed underneath the, you know, the, the juggernaut that's the Imperium. So that was the end of this discussion of the Audiobook Club for January, Valdor, Birth of the Imperium. As I said in the beginning, I hope you guys enjoyed very much. Please tell me your thoughts down below, drop a like, and there will be another one of these, hopefully, coming in February, where we're looking at Flight of the Eisenstein. So as always, I'll see you guys in the next one.